So, hi everyone, I'm Nat, and if you haven't attended before, I'm the head of community at Exceptional Individuals. We are a UK-based neurodiversity employment partnership organisation. Basically, we're a social enterprise that supports people with dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, any alternative way of thinking, which isn't inherently a disability, but due to the society we live in, it does put added strain and challenges. So we look at both the positives, the hardships, the medium, the neutral, everything in between. And we mainly focus towards people who are of working age, but honestly, this stuff can be useful to anyone. Now, I am dyslexic myself, so you know, you're in safe hands. So yeah, let's get right into it, because today's going to be a little bit sassy, but in a good way. Hi from Devon. Oh, see. Oh, Denver. Yes, Jessica. I lived in Denver two years ago. I love it. It must be early. Now, what, as you may know, we support people who are neurodivergent. We get them into work. We make sure they find a decent employer who's not going to discriminate them. Fingers crossed. We make sure they have everything they need to succeed. And we also work with employers to make sure they understand what is neurodiversity, but also how to get the best from it. So with our lovely pitch aside, oh, FYI, we're 80% neurodiverse. So we're a team of like-minded people. So now we've gone how not to talk to a dyslexic. These are some of my top pet peeves, as well as some people I talk to on the internet to kind of get their opinions, but I'd love to know your opinion too. So I'm going to be talking mainly as if you are all dyslexic. So if you aren't dyslexic, respond in a way which is from the point of view of someone who you know who is dyslexic. So first of all, you just need to focus. I am sick to death of people telling me I need to focus. We don't need to focus. It's part of how our brains work. And you're always in school continuously being told you just need to apply yourself more. You just need to concentrate. You just need to keep your head in the game. Gotta, gotta, gotta get your head in the game. That's a quote from High School Musical. But anyway, the point applies. Stop telling dyslexics that they need to focus. It's not a matter of attention. So I, my first question of you, what did you get told to try harder at? either at school or at the workplace? Is there something which you were doing your absolute best as it is, but it never seemed good enough for a neurotypical person, maybe with a lack of understanding? Again, I do not think a lot of people go out of their way to make us feel excluded, but sometimes unintentionally you can make someone feel that they're not good enough or lower their self-esteem. I know with spelling, people say, oh, you know, if you just try hard enough, you'll do it. And they say it in a very motivating way with some inspirational music in the background or like a TED talk playing over the top. It doesn't help. So we've got schoolwork, math, concentration, spelling, proofreading, keeping up with note taking, reading out loud, schoolwork, read quicker, particularly in group work, typing and spelling, attendance. These are all really, really great suggestions and sadly I can resonate with all of them so that's going to be our number one thing when you're talking to a dyslexic telling them to focus isn't going to make them focus any harder maybe we can find another way around it and it's normally because when we're trying to tell someone to focus we're telling them to learn in a way which is typical to the mass population but because their brains do not think that way you're basically telling a fish to climb a tree ain't gonna happen i was originally gonna say climb uh go upstream but there are some fish that can climb up rivers but you get the point being generally quicker at things if this counts yeah absolutely the next one is other people do not need to know about your dyslexia i'm talking to you career coaches so many people say, oh, at interview, you do not have to talk about it. Keep it to yourself. They don't need to know. I mean, this isn't like a deep, dark secret. It's not like my family, like, murdered a whole bunch of people. It, I'm just dyslexic. I'm proud of being it. If people want to discriminate against me, well, they're going to do it anyway. But the thing about dyslexia is it's that elephant in the room. It's invisible. Yes, you can't see dyslexia, but it's going to come out sooner or later. So whether or not you should tell your employer at the interview stage, I'll be honest with you, it's up to you. But what I should say is giving someone the advice not to tell isn't a great piece of advice. Telling them the, the truth, like 
yeah, you might be discriminated against, or you might be able to get support early on. Giving someone the choice to make that decision, because I can promise you they'll end up resenting you if they keep it to themselves and then they struggle later down the line and they feel that they could have had support had they have felt empowered enough to talk about it. So with that, my next question to you is, what do people think when you tell them you have dyslexia? And if you do not have dyslexia, answer what was your initial thought before you knew better. So the first one is, it means I can't read. People just assume you are illiterate. Yet did you know, only like 1% of people who are dyslexic are illiterate. The vast majority of us can read. I have unique strengths. Yes, yeah, superpower. Oh, not many people assume that the first time you meet them. I have lower intelligence. Huh? <laughs> yeah, people always assume you're not the brightest spark, not the brightest colour in the packet. And as a result, I'm pretty certain most of us were all in the bottom sets in school, despite not being, you know, we've got some stuff going on up there. Dyslexia and intelligence aren't the same things. They're different. Stop putting them in the same box. And I'm a good problem solver. This is a bit of a mixed bag because, yes, dyslexics can be good problem solvers, but we're not all good problem solvers. It's like saying every autistic is, is Rayman. It's not the case. So these negative stereotypes can also be positive negative stereotypes, if, if that makes sense. So these are really useful. And at the moment, sadly, most of you found it meant you couldn't read or you have low intelligence. And even 2021, like 100 years since dyslexia has been, you know, in conversation, we are still referring to it as a debilitating disability which lowers your potential prospects in life. It doesn't have to be that. You can acknowledge the challenges without condemning it at the same time. Okay, maybe you should think about alternative jobs when reading in so pardon. I don't know why I did it in a farmer accent, but so often, um, if you're struggling, people say, you know what, maybe, maybe college isn't for you. Have you thought of an apprenticeship? Or, do you know what, university isn't for everyone, there's a lovely job at Sainsbury's going down, or, you know, in job, you know what, maybe you don't want to be a director or a manager, you know, there's nothing wrong with an entry level job. And all these points are absolutely true. I am not dissing any of those other positions, but just because I'm dyslexic doesn't mean I should be automatically pigeonhole into a job which doesn't reach my full potential. I'll tell you all a bit of a story. When I was in school, it was in my second to last year, anyone who was in the bottom sets, they weren't allowed to study English literature because apparently you'd find it too difficult. And as I was dyslexic, I was automatically in the bottom sets. So I had some free time on my hands and no lie, they made every single underachiever go and study bricklaying. I'm not dissing bricklaying, but I'm not a bricklayer. Look at me. These arms aren't doing any bricklaying, and yet they forced us to do it. And already they set our expectations. They lowered the bar. They told us what we can and cannot be. I refused to do that and kind of didn't attend school. So automatically, I'm a troublemaker as well as an underachiever, as well as a bricklayer. And I didn't want to be any of those things. So always think, when you're talking to someone dyslexia, yes, they are going to struggle. Yes, they are going to find things more difficult than the average Joe. But that doesn't mean they have to redirect. If they've got their goal on astronaut, let them be an astronaut. And in fact, we do have dyslexics who are in NASA. We do have people with dyslexia who have gone on to be doctors and lawyers. We actually support a lot of lawyers. You wouldn't believe it, but there's a massive group of lawyers who come together who are all dyslexic. So really, it doesn't have to be a limiting factor. I warned you today was going to be basically me ranting for a while, but hopefully you can get passionate about it too. So my question to you now is, have you ever been told to aim lower due to your dyslexia? Yes, by your teachers. Jim, maybe college isn't for you. Your family, you know what? Not everyone's going to be a manager or a doctor to yourself. Maybe you're self-deprecating. You're continuously telling yourself, this isn't for you. 
you're going to struggle. It's not worth the hassle. Or no, thankfully, you live a blessed life and no one's ever put you down for thinking in an alternative way. The students I counselled. Okay, wow. So the, the biggest villain in this story is ourselves. We're normally the people who are lower expectations. But let's be real, we didn't get this low opinion of ourselves naturally. It was something that we learned. We aren't born thinking we're less good or less intelligent. It's something that we pick up from our surroundings, whether passively or obviously. You can see the self-esteem drop. And, you know, of course your self-esteem is going to drop. You know, when you start school, we're all equal. Then it's solely... You, uh, you struggle, things are difficult, so other people get ahead. Then you get put in the bottom sets and your other sets learn more. Then they get more opportunities and you get lower opportunities. And slowly the gap between achieving and underachiever gets further and further apart. If you weren't already at a disadvantage, you definitely will be by the time you finish the educational establishment. So the trick is, can you hold on to your self-esteem long enough that by the time you finish school, you have just enough to chuck all it behind and like go off in your own direction and succeed or have you burnt out to the point where you just do not care anymore and that seems to be one of the biggest issues with the neurodiverse people we support dyslexia doesn't go away in adulthood it's there your entire life but also that baggage that you had with you also continues my next one if you don't learn to read you'll never be successful Karen, I sorry, I appreciate there's some Karens in the group, and I am sorry, but just because, you know, it's synonymous these days, but sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you don't learn to read, you'll never be successful. Uh, people would say, you know, there's a set way of reading, like, or learning, or spelling. These things are essential. You're, you know, your first pass to get to where you want. No. No offence taken. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Cad was t talking to a psychic at a, oh, physics <laughs> at A level. And my teacher said to me, I did physics, it's hard, and stared awkwardly. I know I wasn't allowed to do certain things at college. You went, you know, you're going to find it really difficult. Okay, so, and what I mean by this one is people, they, they try to, like, motivate you. Like, if you're struggling and want to give up, it's like, this is your, you've got to do this. And yes, it's important to encourage someone to be able to learn the, the basics. However, there are alternative ways of doing things. For example, I can read, but I am a slow reader. So I use audiobooks and there's, it still counts. I recently just listened to the entire Lord of the Rings from The Hobbit all the way to The Return of the King and Dependencies. You might say that's not reading, but I disagree. I know the story back to front, all the language, the terminology. I know just as much as anyone else. I just happen to read it in an alternative way. Deneen says, I heard through my middle school and high school I would struggle. I definitely felt like a failure to, for so many years until myself, a guidance coach, he told me to see my dyslexia as a strength and to ignore the past and memories. It massively helped me to break free and get a regular job. Thanks for exceptional individuals for supporting me until I got my new job. So I had to drop out of the great support sessions. Oh, thank you. Karen, what a great mentor, Danny. I like that. Yes, Jessica loves audiobooks. I'm a un oh, okay, Penny says, I'm at university and struggling. I've decided to take some time out. However, I will not give up. And yes, Penny, absolutely. University, all those things are always going to be extra challenging because it was created for someone who doesn't think like you. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means you might have to go a bit of a different route. And so what if that takes a few extra years? It took me like two years to get into university after leaving college because the way I learned didn't meet their entry level requirements. But I got in there eventually. Elaine, world changed with audiobooks. Read 68 in a year from previously reading two books a year. I completely agree. Each year I struggle to read like three books. Now I'm getting through like, I think I'm on like 28 books this year alone. It's amazing. I also listen at really fast, sort of, and that's because my brain has trained itself to process verbal language really fast, so I get through countless more. 
Then he, I read books but love audio books on YouTube. Listen to The Hobbit, Chronicles of Nadia, Howl's Moving Castle, some of my favourites. And that's a great thing. Dyslexics love reading just as much as anyone else. We might just have to do it in a slightly different way. So my next question to all you lovely people, what have you succeeded at? Not despite of your dyslexia, but because of it. And again, if you do not have dyslexia, what is some examples of someone who has gone above and beyond, not despite it, but because of it? Remember, it doesn't have to be the sole reason, but it might be something which aided in that success. Jessica says, I'm a big fan of speeding up my books. Other people say it doesn't sound like English anymore. I completely agree. I cannot listen to YouTube videos now with it not being on like a fast setting because I just don't find it as engaging. But I get through so much stuff. Nice. Really great. OK, we've got gaining my level seven PGCE. Well, congratulations. I'm good with people. Absolutely. Passionate and kindness. That is a skill which people don't often mention, but I'm really glad you did. Problem solving. Love it. Started my own business. Congratulations. Getting my uni degree. Good at maths. Patience. Neurodiversity advocacy. Yay. Seeing a physical solution to a problem that people have been researching in books for months and coming up short. I like that. You know, we need people like us. I'm not saying we are the next evolution. No, but we are equally needed in society. We need people of all sorts on the spectrum from all different ways of thinking. Loyal. Nice. Creativity. Perfect. Thinking outside of the box. Love it, love it, love it. My next top pet peeve is have you tried using a spell checker? Duh. Like, what do you think? I've, uh, I've been living in a closet for the last 100 years. Of course I've used the spell checker. Ah, oh, but the thing which people do not realise is with spell checkers, they're only good if you know how to spell the word re relatively well. Some words, I am so far off that it doesn't stand a hope in understanding. And people say, oh, have you used Grammarly? Don't get me wrong, I love Grammarly, but it still isn't perfect. And when you're an adult, a lot of the mistakes that you currently do time and time again are so ingrained in your brain, it's very difficult to, like, take it away. And do you know how traumatising and demotivating it is to see that little red line under everything you write? Did you mean? Did you mean? Did you mean? Yes, yes, yes. No. It, you know, it's soul-destroying sometimes. And people will always comment on your work, like, Oh, yeah, you know, a bit careless. Couldn't you just spend a bit more time? And I'm like, I've got spell check. I've got additional software. I've got Grammarly. You know, how I can't run any more computer softwares. Of course, I've tried it. And there are other software. So at Exceptional Individuals, we use a software called Global Autocorrect, which automatically corrects the spelling as you go, rather than saying, did you mean? Because it sucks. Sorry. So Elaine says, my grammar seems to be the thing. Had to give up learning Gaelic because it has so much more grammar scenarios in English. Well, congratulations for trying. I've tried to learn French, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, and I have failed at all of them. <laughs> Grammarly makes me go a bit OCD. I like Grammarly, but it's, it's not, nothing's 100%. Yes, living with dyslexia is like living with trauma. <laughs> Sadly, yeah. So people often say, oh, you're cheating by using audiobooks or by using spell checkers or this assistive technology. I mean, have you ever been told that what, the way you're doing things, that your coping mechanisms, your alternative ways of solving problems is not the correct way or is cheating due, due to your dyslexia? This normally comes from someone who say is neurotypical, who for whatever reason, doesn't like the way you're doing things because you found a different way of achieving with the same or if not better results. Having notes provided. Yeah, I think that's a perfect one. I In exams, I would have someone, you know, in the olden days, <laughs> I'd have someone reading my exam questions to me and people say, oh, that's cheating because, you know, maybe they're giving you the answers. Trust me, they were not giving me the answers. Longer to take a test. Yes, extra time is another classic. It's not cheating because the way my brain processes, honestly, 
if I was given the same amount of time as you, I would achieved no grades and I would be on probably on benefits my entire life because I would be completely unemployable. Is that really cheating the system if I do not want that outcome? Some people say listening to a book is not reading. I get that all the time. I, you know, so every now and then I say, oh, I've read this book recently. And they'll be like, whoa, 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 no, you didn't. I'm like, why is that something? Why is that the hill you want to die on? In the 80s, my brother primarily, prim, my brother's primary teacher wouldn't let him wear blue tinted glasses in class because they were considered sunglasses. See, that's a perfect example of what I mean. It's not cheating. Anya, I got my accommodation, if you can call them that, oh, accommodations, ignored or revoked as my placement. He seemed to think it was a perk, not something to be played, uh, not something even to even the playing field. I mean, again, sorry to hear this, but hopefully for those of you who aren't dyslexic, I'm honestly not trying to shame anyone. It's just knowing that sometimes these little things that you might not think of, like, hey, do you mind taking those blue glasses off? Or, ah, yeah, can you actually try reading the book rather than listening? It might not mean much harm, but the, the effects that that can happen on an individual day in, day in out does result in lower self-esteem. Next. You don't look like you have a disability. Has anyone ever told you you do not look disabled or you don't look dyslexic? This is a classic one, but I'm sorry. What am I meant to look like? Quasimodo? I don't know what it meant to mean. Like, okay, I've got glasses. You know, that doesn't mean I'm dyslexic, but I, I don't really get what you mean by that. It's, we assume that people with dyslexia all look like hillbillies. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, you really can't tell the difference. Jackie says, yes, all the time. So frustrating. So if you are dyslexic, I just want you to describe what do you look like? Like, do you have blonde hair, brown hair? Do you have, you know, like fat flowery clothes? Just what do you look like? And by the way, this picture is what a... Um... Can I say something, Kelly? Oh, yes, please do. I, I know you say people... With dyslexia, what do they look like? Well, you don't look disabled, but I think to bully someone with this, who other people can sense, there must be something about you to approach them just by looking at you and bullying. Because I've been bullied so many times, I don't know, it just, it just makes me, is it the way I look? Or there must be something they can sense. You might not look it, but there's some people who, who are very tuned up, I suppose, they can sense like just something about you that they can pick on. Yeah. Oh, and thanks. put you down. No, thanks for sharing that, Farzana. And I, I get the same vibe, to be honest. And I, I would, my guess would be it comes down to confidence. People can sense if you're confident or, or not. So maybe it's that. There's somebody who looks at me and said, oh, um, she's about to try and tease me and put me down. And, and I, love, I know she was trying to, you know, upset me in some way. But I was thinking, I've never seen her before. I've never met her. Is it something they can sense? Like, I've been bullied a few times. This, this is the point, just by, I think, um, probably the way I look. So I try to master that. And yeah. probably try, try putting makeup on and try and look more confident, of course, in that way. It's a good point. I mean, to my knowledge, there's no, like, dyslexic sixth sense. But I do think... You know, if you think differently, naturally your mannerisms are going to be a little bit different. So maybe people can pick up on it. Um, but Jessica says sometimes people are just mean. And sadly, I think that's the case. Not a great answer, but haters are going to hate. Okay, we've got Helena says only 8% of disabled people use a wheelchair. 8%. And yet it's the only way people think of disability. It's so true. <laughs> it's like people, they're always doing the, the wheelchair image. Uh, I don't resonate with it. But as I was saying, this image here is offensive. And the image came from a police sketch. You know, they're um when they try to like find individuals. And uh, that's how they describe the person. And I think a lot of the time we just associate a certain type of look. And from terms of what you look at, we've got people who said they've got blue eyes, brown eyes, brunette, green eyes, brown hair, tall, short, petite, blonde, hazel, it looks like an adult, tall. Interestingly, none of these are all consistent. 
So if you, I was to ask you to draw a dyslexic just by what you've written here, you wouldn't be able to do it. I know I'm calling out obvious here, but you really can't tell. You, you, you can't. And you shouldn't ever assume. But it also works the other way. That just because someone doesn't look dyslexic doesn't mean that they don't need help. Or just because someone looks disabled in whatever way you assume looks doesn't mean that they're incapable of doing something. So it really does work both ways. Next, what happened? Have anyone ever gone up to you and uh, when you told them you're dyslexic? Did they ask, what, what happened? You know, did your mum smoke when you were, when she was pregnant? Did you get dropped on the head? Like, did you sniff glue? You know, did you do drugs too much as a, when you were younger? W what happened? You know, was your mum, like, did she have special needs? Did, are your parents related? Have you ever been asked any of these ridiculous questions to try to rationalise or kind of, like, explain why you are the way you are? It's sometimes people do this just to be a conversation starter. I know, like I said, a lot of the time it sounds like I'm talking about people just being mean, but the truth is, it, it, a lot of time it isn't people being mean, it's just people being a bit ignorant, but curious. And sometimes that curiosity can come off a little bit offensive. Maybe not in a massive dose, but if it happens to you time and time and time and time again, it is going to have a knock-on effect. And they said, not had that experience, thankfully. Oh, I'm glad. People have always asked me why I'm dyslexic. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, scientifically, I know why, but I don't know why, why. So what have people thought was the cause of your dyslexia? And this is a quite an interesting one, you know, maybe not so much for dyslexia, but with autism, people love saying, oh, I bet you had an injection, MRI, you know, mumps and measles, or, you know, I bet you did LSD, or there's always lots of reasons about why you had something. Karen says, as a tutor, I am delighted when people explain that they are dyslexic, because I can ask them what, what support. I can then ask them, what would support their learning? What can I do? Well, I think that's a perfect way of doing it, Karen. We've also got watching too much TV or sitting too close. Yeah, though that's a great one. I told you, oh, if you watch too many cartoons, you're going to end up dyslexic or, you know, you're not reading enough books, you'll be dyslexic. They use the word dyslexic and low intelligence interchangeably. So anything which would result in you not learning effectively results in dyslexia. Being lazy, yeah, if you don't get off your bum, you know, being stupid. And it's, it sucks that those words have come synonymous. That all kids have something now. Yeah, that's a classic one. Like, ugh, all kids ADHD these days. Everyone's dyslexic. Genetic, supposedly. Didn't pay attention in school. Just want a label. Yeah, that's a great one. Or maybe the cause of your dyslexia is you just wanted extra time. You were lazy in exa you were lazy at school, so you needed extra time. Or you just wanted a Mac. Oh, that was when I got at university so much. It's like, because they, they allowed me to get a Mac because I was doing television production and I had to use the Mac because of, for the, the course and the equipment needed. I, you know, it wasn't a luxury, but then people just assume I was exploiting the system. Okay, entitled, great one, yep. Okay, next, I would never think you had a learning disability. Now, this one is a bit different from you look. I didn't think you don't look disabled. It's just thinking someone who's known you for like a couple of hours or a week or so, and it crops up in conversation. Yeah, I'm dyslexic. No, you? No. And that's because they, people have this idea that all dyslexics are struggling. Every dyslexic is fighting for their life. Every dyslexic really just struggles to write their name. Every dyslexic sees the world moving around when they're trying to read. Yet, some people can be dyslexic and be successful. And actually, not just some people, a lot of people. There's a countless examples of people who, you know, say it. And I know it was earlier we mentioned about people telling you not to mention you're dyslexic. But also, if you don't want to mention it, you don't have to. And not everyone needs to, like, fly the flag and be a, uh, an advocate for it. Sometimes it's okay just to, to be. Jessica said, some of the worst things come up when people think they are helping or think they are being nice. It's not a compliment. Yeah, no thanks, Jessica. 
Yeah, this isn't a compliment. People sometimes use it as a compliment. I didn't think so either. It shocked the hell out of me. Thanks. So many actors, singers and dancers are dyslexic. I know this as I trained as one and so many in this industry and many others. We are great with telling stories with our voices and body. Dani, I completely agree with you there. We used to uh, work in a studio space. There was lots of actors and uh, amazing storytellers. But I promise you, telling someone they do not, you never thought or never would have guessed they're dyslexic is not a compliment. Essentially, you're reinforcing that it's a negative, that they somehow managed to overcome or kind of cheat the system. It's not. Who does not have a learning disability out of these classic celebrities, Kira Knightley, Richard Branson, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, Keanu Reeves? And this goes back to the previous question. I wouldn't have thought you had it. Now, for those of you who are in the neurodiversity space, these celebrities crop up time and time and time again. And I purposely use ones that most people will know that have come out or are known to be dyslexic. But when you look at them, it's not your first thought. Kira Knightley, what is your first thought? Amazing actor. Richard Branston, great entrepreneur. Whoopi Goldberg, really funny. Steven Spielberg, incredibly talented director. Keanu Reeves, Matrix, or whatever. But like all these people, dyslexia isn't the first thing you think of. And when you're told about them, you're surprised. But should you be? Because dyslexia is, does normally result in being a great storyteller. It does normally have added creativity. You normally do become a really good problem solver or someone who can think outside of the box. So maybe when we find people are really successful and they say they're dyslexic, maybe we shouldn't be so surprised. Or maybe be surprised if they're not. I don't know. These are just questions. All of them have some kind of disability. Yeah, they do. All of them. And this is just a very, very small, small sample size. Brilliant. My next one on the list is, oh, do you have dyslexia? I've heard of that. I'm sorry, but every Tom, Dick and Harry thinks they're a flipping genius in dyslexia. Whenever I'm teaching neurodiversity, I'm always teaching dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism and ADHD because they're like the most common ones. And people are never bothered about dyslexia. They're like, I know that one. Let's focus on autism, the juicy one. And what I say to people is, yes, autism is a really complex condition. And it, you know, I'm sure a lot of you do not know much about it at the moment. But do not take for granted that you think you know dyslexia like the back of your hand. In anything, it's one that needs more education than any of the others. And that's because people think they know what it is. And that wrong understanding has negative consequences. For, so for me, that's why dyslexia is something we shouldn't take for granted. We always talk about how autism is so unique. You know, one person with autism, you know, one person with autism. But doesn't that apply to all of the neurodivergences? I would argue yes. We've got Penny says, many dyslexics master literacy skills completely. If you just find something difficult in life, you'll go above and beyond to overcome it. A lot of us are problem solvers. So for me, I, yes, I struggle with like reading and writing, but I actually do it all the time because I love solving problems. Best way to learn about dyslexia is to ask a dyslexic. Yeah. And if I could edit that a bit, I'd say dyslexics because we're all different. Jessica says, people have no idea how complex all neurodiversity conditions are and how much they truly affect beyond the one or two traits that people think they are. It's true. If you Google um, traits or characteristics of dyslexia, you'll get like a, a short list time and time again. But it's so nuanced. It affects so much of your life. It may not be the one thing that kind of changes your entire life. But every little element of your life, it is going to have a slight little knock on effect. And enough of those little knock on effects does equal a very different character for every single person. You can't whistle it down to a couple of tick boxes. You really can't. Anya says, I find that with my ADHD, everyone assumes they know ADHD completely. And when you tell them you're ADHD, but not hyperactive. What? <laughs> that, you, you can't. It's, it's not possible. <laughs> 
Daniel, I think I have dys dyspraxia as well. That's why I feel such an outsider and struggle in the education system. And that's a really another good point. A lot of people who are neurodivergent have co-occurring conditions or comorbidity. If you have one and another one, sometimes one can cancel out the other one or one can exacerbate the other. So say you're looking for all the traits of dyslexia, but you also have ADHD, well suddenly you're going to be looking at a very different kettle of fish. Yeah, I think so too. Penny, sensory and emotionary regulation can also occur with dyslexia. Completely agree. And a lot of the time we're misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or just have a lack of understanding. And even with doctors and professionals, we do not completely understand how neurodiversity works yet. Not even close, to be honest. So just because someone or a book or a doctor says one thing doesn't mean it's true. I'm not saying everything's fake news, but do not be scared to like poke it a little bit and, you know, find out for yourself. So my next question to you is what does it mean to be dyslexic, either for yourself or just your opinion? Cool. And for this, I just want to find out how similar is our views on dyslexia or do we have quite a diverse view of what we think it is? Karen agrees with Penny, watched a great neurodiversity masterclass by Cognizant talking about the different thinking domains. Thanks, I might check that out. So what does it mean to be dyslexic? Being different. Different from what? Unique. We're all unique. Ch changes to being. Being fun. Being different. Challenges to overcome. Resilience. Elaine says, dyslexia halted my career when I said I thought I had dyslexia and didn't get through any other interviews since I am now seen as a troublemaker with my alternative views. Oh, you're radical. I mean, I'd say get in touch. Like, that is, sadly is very common. Back here, we've got slow, overcoming, finding it hard to read, not knowing directions, being different, can't organise, working a bit harder, special. As you can see again, just like when you say, what, what do you look like? Dyslexia means something different to every single person. Because with this answer, you know, it's a word cloud. If you answer the same thing, the words get bigger. And that's how you know how common something is. If you look at all the sizes here, every single answer is unique. We've not had a single duplicate yet. If that doesn't tell you how, like, you know, diverse dyslexia is, nothing will. Cad says working super hard. Yes. Danny says, for years, it meant that I was a burden on my family, country and human race. Whew. Wow. However, it no noun is a cornerstone of my future career as an actor slash storyteller. This will help me in a storytelling course at Edmondson College next year. Congratulations. So my next one I'm talking about is, are you sure you're not just using this as a crutch? <laughs> and what do I mean by this? People often assume it's just like, oh, okay, you know, oh, you're, everyone's picking out the D card. Every time I can't do something, oh, I'm dyslexic, I'm dyslexic. And my friends take the mickey out of me all the time. Like, oh, I bet he's going to say he's dyslexic again. I'm not using it as a crutch. I re you know, it really does affect so many elements of my life. Kaz says, I'm not dyslexic myself, but when I went on an awesome session at awareness session at work and the tutor explained to me that it's just seeing the world in a different way i found it fascinating i wish i saw things the way the tutor did and i did really are benefits has anyone ever told you that dyslexia is not real have there been any trumpians in the room anyone who says you know it's fake yes or no and if no that's a great thing but there definitely are people out there who might not think it's fake overall but they might assume it's fake for you, that you you found a secret way of scamming the system. You know, you're a, a tax fraud of the education world. Penny says dyslexia is not an add on. It impacts the whole person. Completely agree. And that's why for me personally, and this is a personal choice, I prefer to say I'm dyslexic rather than a person with dyslexia, because for me, it's not an add on. It's part of who I am. But that is a very personal opinion. And I think, you know, whatever you choose, as long as it's right for you. It's not fair. You get extra time on exams. <laughs> oh, man, people always love throwing this at me. It is fair. If you understood how difficult it is, you'd understand. 
Helen says, I'm sure Trump would think it's made up. I'm sure he would. The last one is, I can help you overcome this. This is an interesting one because this refers to the fact that there are amazing people out there who really want to help us. But stop trying to be our saviour. You're not our Jesus. <laughs> well, you're, not, you're not Allah. You're not Muhammad. You know, stop trying to be the one who saves us. Gonna be the one that saves you. <laughs> because we don't need saving. We, we don't. We need support. We need, you know, people to believe in us, you know, maybe adjustments, but this isn't something which, you know, you need to fight a battle for us. We don't want to not be dyslexic, or at least most of us do not. And I think this is one thing, like the session, how to not talk to a dyslexic. Do not talk to us as if this is something which needs to be overcome, that you're doing us a favour we all need support in life whether you're dyslexic or not but you know just be mindful yeah and Anya says we know more about our own condition than anyone and that, that is true remember labels are just that they're labels they you know we're all on a big old spectrum and sudden sometimes we like kind of clip little bits out and like squiggle a name on it but we flow you know we're not so black and white Jessica says there isn't a cure you can provide or treatment. I haven't heard of drinking special tea is the answer. No, but it might be healthy for you. <laughs> so some honourable mentions that we've not talked about today is you must hate reading. We've learned today that a lot of us love reading. Just because you're dyslexic doesn't mean you automatically hate reading. So rather than saying, don't worry, I've got, I've got a different, you don't have to read this. Ask us. Stop being lazy. I'm not being lazy. It's just my brain can't learn in the way that you're providing the information. Oh, I'm a bit dyslexic too. No, no, you can't use that. Just because you find reading and spelling hard doesn't mean you're dyslexic too. You're not a little bit OCD. You're not somewhere on the spectrum. Stop trying to do that. <laughs> it's offensive. You're just stupid. Now, your mates might do this as a joke. Like, ah, you're just stupid. You know, stop using the D card. You know, eventually it does hurt. You know, once or twice, it's a bit funny, but again and again and again for years and years, it does hurt. And don't worry, you'll grow out of it. We do not grow out of dyslexia. We learn to mask. We learn coping mechanisms. We learn ways to, like, navigate the world. But it still is an extra strain, like, chipping away at you bit by bit. And this is why burnout happens. If we didn't have to hide so much, we might not burn out as much. So just a few little things to mention. Penny says, labels help to get support in society. Yeah, and I agree with you. I'm not saying they're completely bad. My mum was told she's not dyslexic. She's bilingual. Bi is that bilingual? Labels can help to get support in society. Helen says, people assume I'm bad at spelling. I'm actually pretty good at spelling, reading and remembering what I've read. Is my Remembering what I've read is the biggest challenge. Definitely not the genetic idea, generic idea people have of dyslexia. I think that's a perfect one as well. People don't often assume memory challenges with dyslexia, but yet the vast majority of dyslexics that we work with have uh, challenges with memory. So I want to know, putting it all to you now, are there any that I've missed? Are there any common things that people assume or say to you as a person who is dyslexic, which you want them to stop doing because it's just not right or hurtful or just wrong anything that i've missed or maybe you have some questions or statements today was very much an opinion session normally it's based on more facts and evidence but i do think it is good to just know that you are not alone maybe something i said today has resonated with you and you're like oh, i'm glad i'm not the only one Penia says, mental health problems are huge for dyslexic pupils. Even in children, anxiety and depression are common. Absolutely, Penny. And that's because of the burnout. You know, if you're continuously a fish trying to climb a tree, you're going to have a bad time and that will result in mental health. So though they aren't, exa they aren't related in terms of guaranteed, they do go hand in hand, unfortunately. Sorry, it's Anya, by the way. Anya, sorry. <laughs> that's my dyslexia, Anya. Oh, my God. No, it happens all the time. You should honestly. correct me. Every time I do it, correct me. 
I've, I've read not corrected someone for 10 years and then I thought I should I should stop I should be more assertive so <laughs> I do pretty well uh, what was my question um some of these um you know like these symptoms of dyslexia and dyspraxia and all of the other ones they're sounding I just call them ADHD like how do you know whether it's ADHD or whether it's they just seem to overlap so much what is the distinguished factor that separates them like how do I know that I don't have dyslexia or something and it's just part of my ADHD does that make sense yeah no, it's, a good, it's a good question and the truthful answer is you, you don't you you don't know but the way I think they do when they go to diagnose people is they look at all your characteristics and they see how many you have that relate to a certain one but more importantly how much does it affect you and that's the thing yeah. because all of us struggle with depression you know memory issues uh, retrieving like all the characteristics of dyslexia and autism and adhd we all have but mm -hmm. does it negatively impact your way which stops you from living your best life and that's mm -hmm. normally like the criteria which kind of tips you over the edge from having something mm -hmm. diagnosed and just experiencing something mm -hmm. yeah because like i've been um told <laughs> that my adhd is pretty uh, like pretty impairing <laughs> Um, I think the other point I was going to bring up was just to go on a tangent is that sometimes um, the perception of like if you get good grades, for example, that can work um, against you as well because they don't realize that you're practically having a nervous breakdown doing that, you know? Yeah. They, um, like, you don't obviously you don't need help. Way. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like you have no idea how much I need help, you know? Like that's why, yeah, so I just thought that was a point to bring up. No, thank you. And I'll try my best for next time to uh, remember the pronunciation of your name. <laughs> it's just because I read phonetically. Do not take it personally. That's okay. So for the rest of you who want to know, we record all our webinars and we upload them to our YouTube channel. And we've got ones like Understanding the Equality Act from a Neurodiverse Individual. What is the pop culture of ADHD? Their brief history of neurodiversity. You know, we do a whole wide range. So this is what you do next. If you like what we do today, get in touch and we can give free support to any individuals. And if you're an organization, maybe we can partner, but I really hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of your day. So Jackie, thanks so much. Very interesting, more tools support neurodiverse pupils and clients. Honestly, Jackie, it's great to have you. I'm always seeing your advocacy online. Really great to have you. Karin, thanks so much. Lovely stuff. Bye everyone. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I want to know if you can help. I'm trying to access your Skype profile. My second question I want to know I know you do, I've got complex needs. I want to know if someone can do a one to one coaching session with me. Hmm. Well, to okay. pick up on what tech information I need because I need that put in place. My colleagues ask, and they ask me for other things that help me, which I really can't think of. Which I'm sure you can think of that we put them in place at college. And the other thing is, um, last question there, I've got a nephew, my nephew's got ADHD, and he is it becoming very hard on top of him, and it's got to point and want to scream because he can't still have much knowledge of it. And they put him in normal school, and the school are just start making sure he behaves and he doesn't feel his learning or observing, absorbing any information. Like, has he been good today? He's got more, he's been good. And he's just controlling his emotions and anything. That's not fair of him. Is there anything you can help to do to help him come over his values, to help him learn at school? Because he's not learning like of anything, it's just telling him he's got primary school, he had a one to one sport worker to help him make sure he sat down for his ADHD. Hmm. But now he's at high school, they don't do that. It's making sure he, he be, behaves and he's done well to it and he gets a point for being well. That's the way it is. But he's not learning anything. He's a very bright boy, I've been told. Mm. But how can he help? So a lot of things going on. Oh, I okay, Fosano. Well, I mean, we aren't necessarily experts in uh, children, but obviously we naturally learn that stuff as we go along. I'd say it's definitely worth going to the GP. I'm not saying medication is the way forward, but it's definitely something which is an option. You've also think, is that type of school right for you? Again, I do not think it's always the right thing for like to be in a special education school, but it's another option which you can investigate. 
I think a lot of the time, if something's not working, keep trying it and, and like trying to focus on it isn't going to work. You have to tr like mix things up a bit. I wish I could give you more advice on that, but I, you know, I that just isn't my area of specialty. And as for the spiky profile, I will speak to the team straight after this and make sure it's all working. And if you're having difficulties, drop myself or the team an email. And if you drop it to me, nat at exceptionalindividuals.com, I will definitely make sure that someone is able to reply to you ASAP. I have a final question about tech support. I want to know how we can, I want to know if someone can have a like, one to one session. I don't know if you can do that because I've got complex mental conditions. I've got yeah, no. stress, I've got OCD, ADHD, anxiety, depression, I've got dyspraxia, I've got hot lots, and I want to know how dot tech. I can't really think of anything. I know there's a lot out there, but I can't think of it really. You can absolutely have a one to one with us. Um, the easiest way to do it is by booking on our website. If that's something you challenge with, you can call us or you can drop us an email. But if if any of those methods, I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's a little bit of a waiting list just because we've got a lot of people interested at the moment. But as you've been coming to our webinars so frequently, I can definitely put you as a priority and, you know, put in a good word. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right, everyone. I am going to leave now because i'm uh, talking for a while but thank you so much again for attending